Good evening. I'm delighted to be with you even virtually, even though I would prefer very much to be with you uh, there. Um, and I apologize that my talk will be in English. Um, you know, it is the only language I speak, and I'm grateful to all of you who, unlike me, speak more than one. So let me start. I, I've been invited to speak under the title The Truth We Choose, which is a reference to the fact that each of our information diets is increasingly personalized and relative, each of us holding only the truths that we already subscribe to. Now, I think it's been explained that my professional and my political concerns center around the impact of digital world on children. So I'm going to address my comments specifically to the issue of truth as it impacts on that demographic. Young people in connected societies are the demographic most likely to get information online least likely to have life experience or developmental capacity to critically assess it, and rarely have the resources to access much of the high quality news and information that sits behind paywalls. Now, those of you who've looked closely at the program will have noticed that I call my talk the truth others choose for you, because I'm going to talk today about how tech companies' business maxim design decisions and determination to treat children as adults are actually choosing the truths that children believe. The tech sector is a business sector that is singular in having no responsibility for what it promotes, sells and shares. And it's almost entirely designed to sell ideas and products to adults. And when that reality collides with a demographic growing up in a world that is not designed for their age and capacity, it's perfectly formed to undermine the simplest of truths, from who won an election, to what a body should look like, to how you measure who your best friend is. So let me start with a business maxim and a piece of research that we recently did trying to establish what role the design of products that children were using had on the information they were seeing. This research had three elements, interviews with engineers, interviews with children, and the creation of some avatars to act as a proxy for those same children so we could see if the avatar made a minimum of active choices, what information it would be given. The engineers were different ages, had been in the profession different lengths of time, lived in different countries, and worked in different parts of the product development process. But whether they worked in gambling, e-commerce, media, gaming, wherever, each independently made clear that the business maxim required them to design systems that ensured three things. That a user of any service would spend as much time as possible online, with making the largest number, uh, uh, networking with the largest number of other users, and making the greatest number of interactions with an ultimate goal of maximizing the opportunity to sell them ideas, products, and services. Now, this is hardly a surprise. The attention economy, economy is well understood. But what was shocking was the openness with which they went on to declare unprompted that the web of the attention and the interaction at any cost combined with the sophistication and persuasive nature of their techniques meant the user did not stand a chance of making autonomous choices. The, choose, the user is not choosing, but being nudged, flattered, and pushed into journeys and behaviors that suit the commercial interest of the companies that they work for. In fact, to a man, and they were, in fact, all men. They acknowledged it was not a fair fight. One said, in this industry, it's very easy to design evil. It's also very profitable. And at times, designing for good will be less profitable, and therefore, we will lose out. Another said, Their actual our actual customers are organizations that use paid for ads, Therefore, they're incentivized, irrespective of its impact on the well-being of society, to basically hook you into the platform. 
Now, I'm asking you to keep that in mind, that this unfair fight that, the, that those who build our digital systems, that in this unfair fight, those who build our digital systems themselves question if we really do have a choice. And then worth keeping in mind also that one third of all users globally are under 18. That is to say, this unfair fight is being had with almost a billion children. So let's think about the truth we choose in that context. And here's a story from the same research. A child goes online and searches for exercise videos and fitness tips. Up come videos from influencers, amateurs and commercial sources jostling for her attention. The child hovers her cursor over an exercise video featuring a very thin girl and the next day more suggestions, including several that feature people who appear to be deliberately starving themselves while furiously working out. The child ignores them, but over a number of days, the screen has become dominated by pictures, posts and videos promoting emaciated concave bodies. And one particularly unhappy post asks viewers to send messages saying that if she eats, will they please beat, ridicule or bully her to stop her? Now, I'm going to stop that scenario, even though it actually goes further and gets more disturbing, because rather than make you sad, I want you to consider what choice that child had. She chose to look at the exercise videos of positively healthy interest, particularly as many young people are stuck at home. But she was offered, suggested, recommended videos that caught her attention long enough to hover the cursor over one of them. And that hesitation was enough to ensure that the algorithm read and responded to her action. Was that a choice? Was that her truth? From there, a series of algorithmic prompts narrowed her choices, led her into a twilight world, a world in which participants have lost a handle on the truth as it relates to their body weight, beauty or purpose, and a sad world that hundreds of thousands of teenagers, particularly girls, inhabit. And I want to be clear, I'm not accusing the designers of privileging pro-anorexia content to young children, but by their own admission, they are so intent on increasing the network, keeping users online and interacting, that they don't take account of the inevitable spiral of how the system they have designed offers ever more extreme content until a child is in that twilight world that, making, that, that makes being thin more important than going to school, playing out, being able to menstruate, or think about anything other than what you are not eating. For these girls, this thinness becomes the totality of their truth. Now, I can tell you the same tale about far-right radicalization in gaming. I can tell you about conspiracy theories about vaccines, about normalizing sexual violence for eight-year-old boys, of gambling, or the spiral of auto-suggestion that starts with provocative women, then women in school uniforms, then school children in uniforms, and ends with naked toddlers. I can tell you the same cycle or about the endless need, uh, the, about the need to send endless messages just to keep your best friend at the top of your friendship list. Irrespective of the subject, it is the machine that is designed to demand interactions that are not freely given and offices choices that are preordained rather than made. My argument this afternoon is not that we have a world of bad actors, fools and liars, and we're choosing our own truths, although people who fit all of those categories do exist. My argument here is that the products and services are designed to a specification that appears to offer choice, but in fact determines what truths people see, experience and engage with, and subsequently the truths they believe, especially if they're children. Now, I said at the beginning, this is a particular problem for children, and that's because it is developmentally normal for a very young child to believe what is pres presented to them. 
It is developmentally normal that a young teen will feel pressure to behave, look or feel as other young teens. It is developmentally normal for young people in their mid to late teens to have a distorted relationship to risk, both overestimating and underestimating its presence, which is why we see some children overestimating the shame and fear about what is said about them online and others showing an almost cavalier lack of regard for their safety or reputation. Both extremes are normal, and both are made more extreme by the interactions promoted by the business maxim that extends use, demands interaction, and rewards sharing to build the network. So why then is it the norm of the digital world to set age restrictions at 13? And why is it the norm and the culture of the tech sector to allow children very much younger than that to access those same services and to be offered digital services that are designed with adults in mind, flying in the face of our legal norms, treaty obligations, and cultural behaviors. The technical answer to that question is that the companies of Silicon Valley have for their own purposes exported domestic marketing legislation called COPPA throughout the world. The more fundamental reason is that one third of all users are children under 18. And if the business maxim is dependent on their data and their attention, then treating them as children will hit the bottom line. As one of our engineers said, the companies make their money from attention. Reducing attention will reduce revenue. If you're a designer working in an attention business, you will design for an attention, whose ever attention it is. So perhaps this is the biggest truth that others choose, or perhaps the biggest untruth, that we can treat children as if they were adult without cost. Because in our connected world, if you demand a child be an adult online, then they are deprived of their childhood altogether. Because a child is a child until they mature, not until the moment they pick up their smartphone. So I, like others, am concerned by the spread of misinformation, the tribes who reinforce their own um, unsubstantiated realities. I'm also disturbed that who gets to speak should be at the whim of Mark Zuckerberg, Evan Spiegel, Tim Cook, or any other Silicon Valley boss. But I would say that before we can really tackle misinformation, we have to uncover some uncomfortable truths that we have been slow to acknowledge. First, not all users are the same. One billion and counting are children. Second, that the technology is not neutral. It's more powerful than any individual user in choosing the range of truths available and the basis upon which that is done, both techno technological and societal, needs to be transparent, accountable, and enforceable. And third, that there is nothing inevitable about the digital world. It is predominantly privately owned and entirely man and woman made. It is designed with an inch of its life to have the outcomes it has, any one of which can be changed. At Five Rights, we work daily to build the digital world children deserve one that is designed to account for their development needs, one designed with their rights, and one that considers their safety as a price of doing business, not an afterthought when headlines get shrill. In that version of the internet, we will be able to understand the truth children choose, but in this version, their truth is chosen for them. Thank you.